I once heard somebody say, it's only green on the radar, so that means I can fly through it, right? This video, I'm gonna teach you the truth about thunderstorms. Have you ever heard somebody say that? It's only green on the radar, or even worse, I've flown in worse weather before. Those are, are words that manifest things that no one here wants to receive because we are creating safer, smarter pilots in everything that we do. And I wanna teach you really the truth about thunderstorms, thunderstorm flying, if those words can even be used together here in general aviation especially. But to better understand thunderstorms, I need you to have a strong foundation. And then we end this video, I've got some fun little bonus content, if you're willing to stick around for it. But let's start with really building our strong foundation. For some of you, this is just good retrieval practice. It's good to hear it again. Bear with me. You have to get through this part to get to the good part, right? So do you remember, before we I even show you the slide, do you remember what are the three ingredients of a thunderstorm? Can you remember? If you can't remember, pause me real quick. I'm going to tell you. What are the three ingredients for a thunderstorm? They are unstable air. I need some instability. I need an uplifting action and I need this excess moisture. Think of the three ingredients of a thunderstorm like a cold front moving through Florida in the summertime, let's say. That cold front comes through and Florida has humidity. We've got this warm, moist air sitting here and that cold front comes through like a wedge. When the hot and cold meet, well that creates our instability right there. Then that cold front wedges its way underneath that warm front taking warm, moist air, our other two ingredients, aloft. Right? It takes the moisture, there's an ingredient, it brings it uplifting action and that's why the leading edge of a cold front in the summertime you will almost always get thunderstorms. Sometimes tornadoes and really nasty activity, the three ingredients of a thunderstorm. Now take it a step further. There's also the three stages of a thunderstorm. Do you remember what they are? I'll tell you real quick here. The three stages of a thunderstorm are first, the cumulus stage on the left-hand side of your screen there. The cumulus stage, that's the building stage. It's characterized by updrafts. Then we have the mature stage. The mature stage starts the moment rain begins to fall. And then lastly, the dissipating stage, when the storm begins to rain itself out. You ever been caught in a storm, it's raining, 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 then all of a sudden everything breaks loose. The drops get bigger, the frequency increases, but after about 60 to 120 seconds, it's over. That's the dissipating stage. Both of those, by the way, all the, the, the three ingredients and the three stages, that's on a private pilot written test all day, every day. Back me up on that, M0 Nation, if you've already taken your private pilot written test, knowledge test, because it's in there and you need to know that. Now can I get into the real world applicability of this? The real world applicability of this, we have to set up, I'm going to call them some thunderstorm rules. And they're not just my personal preference or opinion or even bias. This is coming straight from the FAA, it's coming straight from the AIM. So let's go ahead and let's dive into it. The FAA recommends to never go closer than five miles to any visible storm cloud, here's the big part, with overhanging areas, that's your anvils, and strongly consider increasing that distance to 20 miles or more. You can encounter hail and violent turbulence anywhere within 20 miles of very strong thunderstorms. Can I ask somebody, who maybe has a story and a lot of humility to share it in the comments because I guarantee someone out there has a story of they got too close to a thunderstorm and it was like a washing machine or you experienced hail damage or whatever that may be. Maybe it was just those extreme updrafts and downdrafts that really jarred the airplane. But that's not the only thunderstorm rule. There's a few more I want to work you through straight from the aim. Here's the next one. Don't attempt flight beneath thunderstorms. So often we think, oh, if I can just get under, I certainly can't get over it. It's towering up to 40, 50, 60,000 feet. I'll get under it, at least so I can see. This is where you get the shearing turbulence. This is where you get the microburst. What is a microburst? A microburst is that concentrated column of air that just comes down and spreads its way out. You've read so much about. You still get the washing machine effect, sometimes even more 
trying to scud run. Scud running is just flying in conditions you shouldn't be, trying to run around the thunderstorm here. Your best bet is just get out of there. Make the 180 degree turn and go back home. Don't try to go underneath of that thunderstorm. Here's another rule for you as well. At the first sign of turbulence, reduce your airspeed immediately to that recommended uh, airspeed. Usually that's VA. Sometimes they'll have a recommended airspeed for turbulent air penetration for a specific gross weight. That's typically going to be your maneuvering speed. Slow that airplane up. This literally just happened to me the other day. I was flying through in IFR conditions. It was nighttime. It's very, very difficult at night to spot. They weren't thunderstorms. They were just some, some cumulus clouds that were dissipating their way out for the night. And boy, was it bumpy. And boy, that airspeed, and, and two, three, Mike Zulu, I'm flying 90 knots. Went from 90 to 120 to 80 to 120 again, back to 100. And it was all over the place. And all I could simply do, right, maintain a positive attitude. And I don't mean my attitude, although sometimes that has to maintain positive as well. I mean a positive aircraft attitude. Don't chase the altimeter. Don't chase that airspeed. Bring that power on back. Reduce that power is all I could do. And I, I literally, at some points, brought it back to almost a run-up kind of RPM, about 1,800, and just went nice and slow my way on through there. And you better believe I was pretty, pretty pleased and pretty happy when I broke out the other side. I've got another thunderstorm rule for you here as well and some stories to go along with it. If the aircraft inadvertently, meaning accidentally, penetrates a thunderstorm, maintain straight and level flight on a heading that will take you through the storm in the shortest possible time. You know, I hear these stories so often of, oh, I'm looking for a gap in the weather. Well, let's pause on that thought for a second, this looking for a gap in the weather. Because you know, eight minutes is considered current weather. In fact, eight minutes is a fast return on XM or Nextrad or anything like that. I don't know where you're at geographically, but in Florida, a lot changes in eight minutes. Have you ever stared at a cumulus cloud while you're flying and you're just watching it grow? Eight minutes, that hole, that gap may be there, and you're looking at it, but eight minutes have lapsed, and that gap's no longer there, and you're going right on through it. You can look through the NTSB reports and find in-flight breakups from pilots trying to do just that, find a hole or find a gap in the weather when they really should have been finding the 180 degree turn back out of there is what they really should have been doing with all of that. So the phrase I opened up this presentation with of the Safer Pilot Challenge for this day was it's only green on the radar. You, how, how can you say such a statement like that? It's only green on the radar. Was it on the composite radar or was it on the lowest tilt? Do you know the difference between a composite radar and a lowest tilt? A composite radar is simply just showing you all the visible moisture that's, that's in there. It could be raining, it may not be raining. Lowest tilt is showing you precipitation that's actually making its way to the ground. Yet, do you know how ForeFlight paints the weather versus Garmin Pilot versus my Dynon HDX versus my Avidyne versus your G1000, your G1000 NXI? They all paint the weather and the intensities differently. For example, the Dion HDX may paint weather as pink, the most extreme on my, on my primary flight display on the 2 Mike Zulu, whereas ForeFly on the iPad may only show it as yellow. You can't just make these blanket statements, oh, it's green, I'm going. That statement gets you hurt. And here's the scary part. It might have worked once for them, and it worked twice for them, but they may not get so lucky the third time. You see, when it comes to weather flying, I need you to understand one profound statement, and it's this. Never let compulsion take the place of good judgment. I've got to be there. Get there-itis. JFK Jr. thought he had to be there. Uh, Mel Carnahan's son, Mel Carnahan was the former governor of Missouri, running a very tight Senate race. His son was the pilot. They're making this whole tour all around Missouri. Uh, the line guy came out on the, I believe it was their eighth stop. It was thunderstorms at night and told Mel Carnahan's son, who was the pilot of the Cessna 330, it's like an unpressurized 340, weather doesn't look so good. Ah, I've flown worse weather before. Dad really needs to be there. This Senate race is tight. It's going to come down to a few votes. We've got to be at this, this dinner tonight. Everyone's expecting us to be there. And again, night IFR and thunderstorms led to an accident. So what's the truth about thunderstorm flying? 
The truth is it's nothing to mess around with. The truth is the most powerful maneuver you can learn is the 180 degree turn back out of there. The truth is the best thing you can be doing is on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you're on the ground. And that's the truth about thunderstorm flying. So Missouri Nation, I hope you learned something and maybe you're humble enough to share some stories in the comments as well. I hope you've seen every single video of the 31 Day Safer Pilot Challenge. And hey, I have some bonus footage for you as well. I have some METAR trivia. It's not gonna be on a check ride or anything. It's just fun METAR knowledge. We'll call it content. So if you love geeking out on aviation knowledge, well, right after this quick little commercial break, we'll come back and we'll do that. If not, you're welcome to close out. But if you wanna geek out on some fun aviation METAR knowledge, stick around and I'll see y'all back after this quick message. Hey, Jason, again, I hope you're loving this 31 Day Safer Pilot Challenge. And I know you already love our three amazing checkride books. Did you know they're also all available on Audible and anywhere you can find an audiobook as well? I actually read the question to you, pause for a second, let you think of the correct answer, and then I tell you the correct answer thereafter. It's basically two, three hours of a mock check ride that you can listen to over and over while you're walking the dog, while you're driving the car, while you're at the gym, whatever that may be for you to continue to immerse yourself in aviation. And those audiobooks are all available to you on Audible, on iTunes, audiobooks.com, anywhere you can download an audiobook. So you chose to stick around. I, I like that attitude. I think that's what someone pursuing mastery would do. Now the content I'm gonna share with you, it's more so trivia than anything. I'm calling it content, but it's more fun trivia to impress your aviation buddies, or maybe your spouse, if you wanna just tell them all about METARs, I'm sure they would be just riveted. That's what I do with Magda. We just talk METARs all the time. She's just riveted, I feel like. Anyways, uh, this will not be on your check ride. This is just fun. Where did our METAR language come from? Why does it exist? How does that happen? And you're gonna to wanna to take a screenshot of this and pause this video real quick, because normally I only show this slide to our online ground school members, which you just heard about in the, uh, in the ad before. Here's your ultimate METAR cheat sheet. You ready? Look at it here real quick. Grab a screenshot too. Let me get my cursor over on your screen as well so you can uh, see all of this. So um, again, uh, there's some TAF stuff in here too for began and everything else, blowing, BR, mist. But have you ever wondered? BR, I always teach baby rain, mist. Where does this stuff come from? Where does GS and how does that mean snow pellets? MI meaning shallow. What, shallow what? what? What are we using here? So grab a screenshot of this so, and, and save it somewhere. So obviously if you're ever uh, um, you know, working on a METAR and you have no idea what something means, well, you can refer back to this. Save it as a favorite on your iPhone. I'll even let you screenshot it. If you have an Android, I'll forgive you for that. But that way you have it. Now, where did some of these weird METAR things come from? Let me show you some fun ones here. BC means patchy because where we get our METAR language from is actually the French language. So BC at the top there means patchy and we get the BC from bank as you in, in French as we would say as a fog bank. Um, BR, mist, we translate that to mist, but mist in French. Now, should I, should I try my best French? Would that be brume? Br Brume. I, I'm looking at Magda here. Like she, she speaks like seven languages, so I, I feel like she should know, um, right? Uh, look at shallow. M I for mince, right? We we think to mince something. You mince vegetables. You make it small. You make it thin. Well, it really means shallow, and that's where we get that from. Um, F U. Have you ever wondered that one? I, I paused there for effect, just to kind of be funny. I don't know if it was funny or not. Means think in Spanish, right? You know. Uh, you see the signs, no fumar, right? Well, fumi in French, that's where the F-U comes from to show smoke. Anybody, anybody mind just blown so far, right? We get it from the French language. Do I have permission to share just five other really nerdy METAR facts to, to loop all this in here? Hopefully you're, you're enjoying this. If not, you're always welcome to leave, but I'm just telling you, there's just some cool, nerdy aviation knowledge. Let's run through five METAR facts real quick. Watch this. The descriptors we just talked about, 
MI, mints, right, shallow, BC and PR shall only be used in combination with the letter abbreviation FOG, so to describe FOG. So you'll only see MI, meaning shallow, associated with FOG. You'll only see BC, or patchy, associated with FOG. So it'd be MI, FG, shallow FOG. BC, FG, patchy FOG, to show that. Here's another one for you. Um, DR means low drifting. Low drifting is only used for dust, sand, or snow that is, you ready for this? Raised by the wind to less than two meters. I, I told you Magda's in love, right? Coming from, coming from Europe. Now we're talking meters. We're talking something she can understand over here. Less than two meters, roughly six feet above the ground. BL, blowing, shall be used to indicate dust, sand, or snow that's raised by the wind to a height of two meters or more. DR and BL will only be used with uh, DU, dust, SA, sand, or SN, snow. So the difference between DR, low drifting, and BL, blowing, is the height at which it's proceeding. If it's less than six feet or if it's more than six feet. Fun fact of the day. You ready for another one? Let's look at it here together. SH, showers, and TS, thunderstorms, shall only be used with RA, SN, PL, GS, and GR. For example, SHSN, snow showers, and TS, GS, which is hail and snow pellet showers. Sounds like no condition that I want to be flying in now, does it? All right, can we look at another one here together? The descriptor FZ shall only be used in combination with the letter abbreviations FG, right, fog, DZ, drizzle, RA, rain. So FZ, freezing, RA, rain. That's the only time you're going to see freezing used in those combinations. All right, I got one more to blow your mind, then I promise, I promise we'll, be, we'll be done. I'll say good pot's always learning, and we'll, we'll see each other again tomorrow. One more. You ready? Let's do it. Within eight kilometers. I'm telling you, it, it's, cr it's crazy. We got to get, get on this here. Within eight kilometers of an airport, the proximity qualifier VC shall only be used in combination with the letter abbreviations uh, TS, DS, SS, FG, FC, SH, PO, BLDU, blowing dust, BLSA, blowing sand, BLSN, blowing snow, and V. A, that's vicinity. So when someone says there's thunderstorms in the vicinity, what's the vicinity? Eight kilometers, as if you we didn't have enough things to convert Celsius and everything else and nautical miles and all knots to miles per hour. We, there's a lot going on in aviation, right? Now you know the definition of a vicinity though and how that's actually used. Some fun METAR trivia. We started talking about the truth about thunderstorms. I hope you stuck around until the end. MZ Nation, you all are awesome. Can't wait to read your comments below this video, YouTube, Facebook, uh, and everywhere else this is posted. Have a blessed, amazing, outstanding, excellent day. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you.